loves what debate does for people like you all. And he came back and he started working with the Atlanta Urban Debate League as a, high, as a college junior and senior. He did a great deal of work. He spent this past year, the year before this one, revising the way in which we teach urban debate, the urban debate students with the packets that he put together for the evidence that you have today. So the evidence that he put together and the way he put that together re revitalized and changed the way in which we teach students so that they are more engaged in the material. He started giving them articles with the <coughs> evidence so they could read and understand it. It was brilliant, it was innovative, and it's changing the way uh, we are teaching debate both in the Atlanta Urban Debate League and I have a feeling soon around the country as well. So we are very, very happy that Ross has shown that kind of dedication. He spent a bit better part of May putting together the evidence packet that you have online and you have accessible to you, especially the affirmative side of that packet. He did a great deal of work on that material, and uh, we all owe him a great deal of gratitude. And he is here now to talk to you about his brilliant work. So please, all attention to Mr. Ross Gordon. So I think the thing that, and I think John mentioned this yesterday, um, the thing that is really interesting to me about this topic is that y'all are getting thrown into the middle of a debate, which is happening right now, which is going to continue to happen for the next couple of years, um, and which is going to have pretty serious consequences for the kind of world that I will live in for the next couple of decades, and obviously also the world that y'all live in for the next couple of decades. Um, the technology around mass surveillance is different than it's ever been. More stuff is online than has ever been before. More of our lives are lived online. Um, we're sort of in a place where most of what we do is now, at least in theory, accessible to people who would like to see it, meaning governments or people who have access to that technology. Um, so I know when I was growing up, a lot of people would tell me, and even now, be careful about what you put on Facebook, be careful about what you like read on a blog or whatever, because you don't know who would see it. Maybe uh, an employer will see it one day, maybe you won't be able to delete it, whatever. And that may be true, but something that has sort of evolved in the past couple of years is even stuff that you aren't posting publicly online, right? Stuff that you might just search in Google, an email you might send to a friend, even that stuff may in some sense be available to people who would want to see it. And that doesn't mean people are looking at it, but it does mean we live in a world where it's increasingly possible for people to see it, and in which that's, that's something that we need to think about. Um, so that's why I'm sort of excited to, to think about this topic and talk about this topic. Um, I'm here to talk today about the affirmative. Um, so for those of y'all that are new to debate, I, don't, I probably don't need to talk about this too much. I assume you talked about it in lab. But basically in debate, we have a big topic, something like you should reduce surveillance. And then we choose a specific example of that topic to talk about. Um, during the year, you might hear a lot of different stuff, but at camp, to keep it simple, we narrow it down to one thing. So this particular affirmative that y'all will be debating at camp is about mass surveillance. So it's about the surveillance that can occur to all of us at any time in which everybody's communications can be swept up and then later sort, searched through to try to find whatever intelligence agencies like the NSA might be looking for. So uh, there's going to be three parts to this. Part one is going to be some background. Uh, part two will be I'll ask you a question um, and you'll have some time to think about it and answer it. And the third part I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about the affirmative, about the different parts of the affirmative. Um, and maybe a little bit about how, how you can think about debating. So part one, background. Um, I think this is also something that John may have mentioned yesterday. Um, I think history of surveillance goes back a long way, but I think the most important thing to know about in terms of recent stuff is the church committee. Um, not something, honestly, I know a great deal about, but basically a bunch of stuff got leaked to the press. A bunch of journalists did some investigative work, and they found that the CIA was doing some assassinations of foreign leaders. They found that the army was spying on US citizens, and all of this came out to the public. And people didn't think this was going on before, or at least didn't know it was going on before. And so it caused a huge public outroar. And there were a series of hearings over two years, chaired by the senator named Frank Church. Uh, and he just, he really stuck it to the intelligence agencies. He really uh, took advantage of all of the public eyes that were on him as a senator, and he gave a bunch of speeches, and he brought intelligence people to testify before Congress, and he basically got this legislation passed, the FISA Amendments Act, which, or rather the FISA Act, which put a lot of restrictions on what surveillance agencies were able to do. So this had a couple of effects on 
the ability of agencies like the NSA, the National Security Agency, to spy on Americans. One is that legally it became much harder for them to do it. Um, the way in which that was done, and people will have conversations about exactly how much this matters, but basically they created what's called a FISA court. And the purpose of the court is NSA wants to spy on someone, thinks somebody might be suspicious, thinks somebody might be a terrorist, whatever. They need to go to the FISA court and say, we have reasons to spy on this person, can we do it? And the FISA court will tell them yes or no. When you think of a court, you might think of a courtroom, nice, oak, whatever, lawyers arguing, uh, maybe an advocate for the person who might be spied on, who's making arguments to a judge about why you shouldn't spy on them. None of that is true. What the FISA court was and continues to be is a guy sitting in an office in the Department of Justice, just a guy or a girl, uh, who's appointed to that position. They get some paperwork on their desk. They basically check yes or no, you can or cannot spy. And that determines whether or not the NSA can spy, or at least in theory. Um, and that's all in secret. Nobody knows what's going on there except for the, the FISA judge and the intelligence agencies who are trying to know what's going on. So basically, this provided some amount of oversight. It's not like the NSA was able to just go on and spy on anyone. Um, they had to go through the FISA court first. But in practice, this the FISA court, the dude sitting in the Department of Justice, was usually pretty pretty down to give the NSA whatever they wanted. He, you know, thousands and thousands of requests only denied a couple of them. So this brings us up to 2000, whatever was going on from 1977 to 2000. I'm sure a lot of things, but I don't know that much about them. In 2000, um, the director of the NSA was General Michael Hayden. And when you hear people talk about the NSA now, uh, a lot of times they'll talk about it as if it's sort of all powerful and they can't be restricted and there's nothing you can do to stop them from spying on people. People will talk about it in different ways. That's one way that, that sometimes people talk about it. Um, so it's actually interesting to, to look at how the NSA was operating in 2000. So in 2000, obviously before the September 11th attacks, uh, Michael Hayden went before Congress and he testified. And they were concerned because a movie had just come out. Uh, I forget the name of the movie. But in 99 or 2000, a movie came out. It was like a big thriller. Everybody went to see it. It made millions of dollars. And the plot of the movie was, I think the NSA is spying on everyone. And there's like a journalist who finds out that this is happening. And then the NSA tries to kill the journalist. Um, and this made everybody really upset and scared and basically ended up in Michael Hayden being called to Congress to testify, is this really what's going on? So at the time, it was legal. And there are a few legal distinctions which are worth knowing about. They can be a little bit tedious, but I think they end up being important. At the time, it was probably legal to spy on an American who is communicating with somebody abroad. All right, what does that mean? That means if I'm communicating with uh, a suspected terrorist in Indonesia, that means that not only can the government intercept that Indonesian person's communications, but since I'm talking with them, they're going to get both of our communications. And then in the process, legally, they might be able to also look at my communications. So at the time, Michael Hayden believed that the NSA had the legal authority to do this, but he didn't do it, even though he thought he could, because he was so scared about what had happened in the church committee 23 years ago that so much pressure had been put on the intelligence agencies to not do that kind of stuff. He was so scared that the NSA would be called out for monitoring Americans that he didn't do it. So he went before Congress and he said, he used an example, he said, let me put a fine point on it. If, as we are speaking here this afternoon, Osama bin Laden is walking across the Peace Bridge from Niagara Falls, Ontario, to Niagara Falls, New York, as he gets to New York side, he's an American person, and my agency must respect his rights against unreasonable search and seizure as provided by the Fourth Amendment. The author who's quoting this, James Bamford, who's a journalist who, who covers the NSA, goes on to say, this was an ironic example because as Hayden was speaking, Bin Laden's men had already arrived, and just two days earlier in San Diego, one of his men had taken his fir first flight lesson, uh, which ultimately he was one of the 9-11 hijackers. So at this time, Osama bin Laden, he was known. He had carried out some embassy bombings. He had sunk a US ship. And here was Michael Hayden in Congress telling Congress that if Osama bin Laden was in the United States, they would not spy on him. That's how scared he was about 
what the public would think if they found out that Americans were being monitored. So one thing y'all may hear, actually, let me back up for a second, because y'all y'all were born between about 1998 and 2001, right, generally? Okay, so I, I maybe shouldn't assume that y'all know much about 9-11. Somebody tell me something about 9-11. What happened, General Baker? Well, um, two flights, um, two commercial flights, had been up. But they flew into the Twin Towers, and, um, they, and the, they basically collapsed. And another one flew into the Pentagon, and another one crashed in the field in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so four flights were hijacked. Uh, Pentagon got crashed into, didn't do too much damage. One in Pennsylvania um, just crashed in a field. And yeah, Twin Towers, both struck, ended up collapsing. Did you have something to add? Okay. Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that, that people say a lot, a phrase I've heard, is that after 9-11, everything changed. Um, and that's often said, I think, as if it were inevitable, as if things would have to change because it was such a traumatic, catastrophic event. And maybe it was inevitable in some way. I mean, it was a traumatic, catastrophic event, and after that, things changed. But Everything did change in a lot of ways, and a lot of that were decisions made by people. There were things that didn't necessarily have to change, but that people made the decision that 9-11 was going to be a time when we were going to change totally how we think about security. A lot of policies were going to change. How we think about things like privacy and security were going to change. And that showed up in airports, but it also showed up in a lot of other places. And one place that showed up is surveillance. So after 9-11, by the way, there's a whole question about would surveillance have prevented 9-11. Um, I don't want to go into it because it's, it's complex. I think the answer is no, so I'll just leave it at that. But after 9-11, Michael Hayden was call, called into George Bush's office, um, and basically a conversation took place where George Bush is like, whatever you can do, I want you to do. And even if maybe you can't do it, I still want you to do that. So after 2001, after 9-11, a lot of the protections which were formerly there against NSA surveillance of regular people went away. Um, there was what, if you search Google for it, uh, people called the warrantless wiretap program, um, was eventually exposed in 2007, which was basically the idea that under the Patriot Act, which was legislation passed after 9-11 in response to 9-11, the president has the authority to surveil people without going through the FISA court. Um, so however, you know, much or little check the FISA court might have provided as just one person sitting in an office. Uh, even that check was now now gone. And I should say, a lot of this stuff is secret. So we don't know exactly what was going on. We don't know exactly who was surveilled. We don't know exactly how many people were surveilled. Um, there's journalists who know some things. There are leakers who have leaked some things. But a lot of this is, is we're kind of guessing. It may well be the case that all this stuff was never abused. Um, it may well be the case it was terribly abused. It's really hard to say with, with any kind of certainty. So after 9-11, uh, there was this sort of massive increase in the amount of surveillance. Not only warrantless surveillance, but also the amount of requests that went to the FISA court went up, I think, three, four, five times. As many requests were sent to the court between like 01 and 05 as were sent in the previous 25 years. Not an exact number, but something along those lines. At the same time, um, one thing that I think is important to think about is the NSA doesn't just like magically get your stuff. Uh, they've got to do some work. So um, with the internet, they actually didn't have much of an ability to <coughs> track stuff. Um, they had to actually find ways to tap the wires. Um, as far as phone calls go, there's a building um, if you can search Google for it as room 641A. It's a room in the SBC Communications Building at 611 Folsom Street, which is in downtown San Francisco. And this building contains basically all of the communications, phone communications, which pass through the West Coast. Um, so that includes not just Americans on the West Coast, but also a lot of foreigners might make calls which are then routed through that particular building on 611 Folsom Street. 
And the NSA, after 9-11, went in and they basically created a room, room 641A, that had a bunch of technology in it and took all of the stuff that was going through that building and just copied all of it, 100% of it, just went straight to the NSA. So every single communication that goes through the West Coast. Um, there were other technical things they had to do. Basically, the point is, they had to get some cooperation from the people who ran the building, and they had to actually do the technology. They can't just magically do it. A final example to demonstrate just how big and sweeping some of these changes were after 9-11. In Bluffsdale, Utah, which is a little bit south of Salt Lake City, um, there's a $1.5 billion mega complex being built. Um, it's meant to hold several exabytes of data. Um, an exabyte, I think, is something like 10 to the 24th bytes. Um, that's 100,000 times all of the printed material in the Library of Congress is its storage capacity. Um, some people have said it's enough to record every human conversation ever, um, which probably isn't true. It's probably not enough for that. But what is true is that it can store a lot of communications. And the reason this is important is because the NSA's goal, the thing that they said was, we want to collect it all. Um, they want to collect it all, store it all, and then later search through it to find what they're looking for. And presumably what they're looking for is terrorist stuff, but maybe not, we don't know. Or maybe in the process of looking for terrorist stuff, they find other stuff. So the goal, which is still technologically not possible, of at least the hardcore ideologues who do surveillance is to get everything, keep it for as long as they can, and then later look through it. So a final question you might have is, what is actually collected? Um, what is actually looked at? Um, what it seems to be the case right now is that uh, the FISA court will tell people what they can search for. So basically they tell you what terms you can put into the search engine for all this collected stuff. And then that is what they can search for. But that doesn't cover what individuals can be looked at. Your stuff can still be looked at as long as the search term that the FISA court approves brings it up. So last thing for this section. Um, this could seem small and technical, but I think it's, it's important to know because if you try to go, if you just search surveillance in Google News or whatever, and you try to figure it out, it can be confusing because there's a lot of different laws and a lot of different technical stuff, and honestly, people aren't very good at explaining it. Uh, they kind of keep it shrouded in secrecy more than I think is necessary. Um, so if you just know a few laws, it'll be easier for you to sort through all of this various stuff. So there's three laws that are used to justify this kind of mass surveillance right now. One is section 215 of the Patriot Act. And that law has been interpreted historically to mean that the NSA can collect all of your phone metadata. Have you all heard the term metadata before? Okay, what's metadata? Okay, I couldn't hear that. So, Data about data. Data about data? Okay. Yeah, data about data. So it's, it's everything about the phone call except for the content of the phone call. So that's the time in which the phone call was made, the place in which the phone call was made, uh, your number, the person you were calling's number, um, the location you were when you were calling, all of that collected all of the time for everybody, all Americans. That was how it was interpreted to allow that was the program that actually existed. So in theory, this no longer exists because about a week ago, Congress passed the USA Freedom Act, which was supposed to have stopped this or at least restrained it. Um, <coughs> there was also a court ruling a couple, maybe a month ago, that said that Section 215 of the Patriot Act actually does not authorize that program. That's too much data under Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Um, despite all of this, it's sort of unclear if and how the program will continue. Um, I don't want to get too much into the details. I think maybe safe to say it will probably be restrained in some way, but may also continue in some way. Yeah. So there are three laws for what? Three laws that are used to justify different forms of mass surveillance. And that was just the first one. Yeah. Um, even though like, um, these, these two laws that are listed here, like the Patriot Act and the USA You mean like the older surveillance programs? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, 
at the very least, that program gives a sense of what the NSA is trying to do, which I think is important. And I think also when I talk about the other two laws, they also give a pretty good sense of the kind of stuff that's going on, which will be useful. In this. So the, the second law is Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. And what this has been interpreted to allow, uh, so the NSA, most people will say, not everyone, but most people tend to think that it's okay for the NSA to spy on foreigners. Uh, maybe as many foreigners as they can, maybe all foreigners. At least the law is, is pretty clear that that is something that's acceptable. Um, and the idea is that's for reasons of security or in practice also used to protect economic interests to gather intelligence on foreign leaders, stuff like that. But whatever, it's supposed to be okay to, to spy on foreign leaders. Um, the question is if, and I mentioned this earlier, if an American is communicating with a foreigner, what happens to the American's communications? Um, and there's a lot of technical detail to this. Uh, there's something called minimization, which is the idea you can collect some stuff about the American, but you minimize it. Um, Section 702 has actually been interpreted to mean you can just collect the American's communication. Um, so American communicating with a foreigner, you can look at the American stuff. And that includes stuff like email, stuff on the internet, all that. One problem with this is the way the internet actually works is that oftentimes if you're on the internet and you're communicating in Atlanta to a server, let's say in Kansas, that will actually end up getting routed through Canada. Um, I don't understand why that's the case, but the way the internet is set up, oftentimes your data will cross borders, incidentally, even if you're just sending another communication to the United States. And that's not even taking into account that a lot of the servers that you're communicating with day to day on the internet happen to be located in foreign countries. And what all that means is that the NSA has said that it has the authority to look at that stuff um, because it technically does go out of the country and is there for <coughs> foreign communication. So result of that is that all of this stuff can get swept up um, just because of the technical way that the internet works. So a reason this might be confusing if you were to go and, and read articles on the internet about this, not all articles, but a lot of them will act like Section 215 of the Patriot Act and the Phone Metadata Program are the big deal, and that's what we should all be super scared of. In reality, it may be that this other stuff, Section 702, all the internet communications, that stuff may actually be a lot more important, and the debate over Section 215 may sort of not be such a big deal after all. So that's sort of what people will, will argue about. And the last law, um, which <coughs> is more vague, and maybe less important, but good to know, is Executive Order 12333 which was issued under Reagan, and has basically been interpreted to allow for the same stuff that Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act has been interpreted to allow for. So, surveillance of foreign communications with Americans. Yeah. What did you say the name of that one? Executive Order 12333. All right, I think I gotta, I gotta make a move, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put background aside for now. Uh, does anybody have questions about any of that stuff I've talked about so far? Yeah. So you said like the NSA can technically take stuff that it goes across borders or whatever, so how the internet works? Yeah. Since it's going across borders, doesn't that mean their informational services can also look at it? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. So other people have this data too. So your internet service provider has the, this data, your phone provider has the data, foreign governments may have the data. Um, even the private companies who make the technology that do the surveillance could have the data. So it's, it's not just the federal government. Yep. You said the U.S. can spy on uh, foreign foreigners. Yep. Does that mean that you know other countries with similar technology could just as easily spy on Americans as well? Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that people are concerned about is actually uh, that the U.S. has a very close alliance with Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. These are sometimes called the five eyes, like eyes is in eyes. Um, and it's possible that the British just spy on Americans, for instance, and then give the data to the NSA. So the NSA doesn't have to do it. It's technically not legal, but the NSA still gets the data. Uh, the NSA has said they don't do this. There was one thing that was released where some lawyers in New York were spied on by New Zealand. Um, the lawyers were representing Indonesia, 
uh, and New Zealand gave the data to the NSA. Um, so we know it's happened at least once. My understanding is that uh, they're only a strict reading of the FISA Amendments Act. They would only be able to spy on foreigners outside the United States. Once people are in the United States, they're U.S. persons, and they can't be spied on. Yeah. You said that as long as anyone living in the U.S. has contact with the outside, they're like fair game for the NSA to spy on. Mm -hmm. And but yeah. when you say that, like nearly everyone like communicates with the outside, like even if you're just calling tech support and. Maybe you're getting like a foreign customer service person. Do you think that basically everyone speaks with someone outside the country? Yes. Although maybe something which might make this less of an issue, I guess, is that uh, it's not that they can target you as a person if you contact someone outside of the country. They can target the communication. So they can monitor the call to tech support, but they don't get to monitor you all the time, at least in theory, just because you call tech support also. The FISA court? The FISA court is just the one that reviews what you can look at once you have the communications. So the, uh, the thing on the West Coast, the building on Folsom Street in San Francisco or whatever, that's just one of like 20 different buildings that the NSA has technology in to gather all the data there. So there's also one, I think, in like, uh, like Maryland, and there's one in like South Carolina. Um, and the combination of all of those gives them access to most or all communications. Yeah. Do they have some of those in foreign countries? And if not, how do they get that type of data from foreign countries? Um, I'm not actually sure. Uh, I think there's some partnerships with foreign governments. I think there's some like forward CIA bases and stuff that do it. Um, a lot of because of the way the internet is set up, a lot of communications pass through America. So even a communication between like, you know, a French person and an Algerian person might go through America. Um, but that's I'm not entirely sure. That's something worth looking up. Yeah. Section two fifteen of the Patriot Act just take out. Um, <coughs> or no, sorry. Does the Freedom Act just take out full metadata collection or other just metadata as well? Um. So the, the program that was supposed to be authorized under 215 was just phone metadata, as I understand it. And the USA Freedom Act, um, I'm also not totally sure of the details, but the basic idea is it leaves <coughs> all that information with the companies, and then the NSA has to specifically ask them for certain parts of it. Um, so it still, it still allows for some of it. It doesn't totally get rid of it. Anything else? All right, part two, my question. Uh, who cares? If you go online and read a lot of this stuff, there are people who will just be like, all right, that's fine, but I don't care. So who cares? I'm actually asking you the question. Yeah. part of America doesn't self-censor? Well, I mean, we, we pretty much surveil ourselves. We, we know where, what we're doing, we know what other people are doing, and we just, we're fine with that. We're just sharing what's going on with our lives. It's um, a vital part of teenage life. So does that mean, by extension, you think people are also OK with the government looking at their stuff? If I'm just looking 
because we all do debate or are going to start doing debate here. And sometimes in debate, you look up things like terrorism. right? You might search for things which would be considered controversial and which could conceivably get you caught off in some kind of dragnet NSA stuff. Yeah? I feel like actual terrorists here. Sure. <coughs> yeah? Uh, when it comes to like day-to-day -day American life, Probably most of us wouldn't care to call that much because even though we're giving up part of our uh, privacy and a few of our freedoms, at least for the vast majority of America, they would rather give that up instead of having a state where they're exposed to violence and terrorism. Like, they sure. basically don't want another. Thing. So people would rather have security, yeah. rather have some privacy breach than the risk of a big catastrophic attack. Yeah. All right. General idea I'm getting so far is nobody cares. Uh, <laughs> I care. Yeah, back there. Uh, yeah. Um, well, many people who object to this do so on the grounds that the Fourth Amendment says that you can't it because it gives unreasonable search and seizures. Yeah. And if you're just swept up in some sort of dragon because you searched errors one time for a project, then that counts as unreasonable. Um, And if it violates the Fourth Amendment, then so what? Um, well, part of your rights, I guess. I mean, I guess some people feel strongly about how they should be, that right is sort of part of what the American is. Sure. All right, uh, I'll take one more. Uh, yeah, go. Well, I think that just because we have nothing to hide doesn't mean that surveillance is okay. I mean. Just because I might not have something to say doesn't mean that I should go and ban freedom of speech. Sure. All right, so, yeah, we're going to find this job. I think the issue is in that, well, I think people care, they just don't care enough. Like, we have this function that we're not, like, one of the people being decided that we say, well, oh, it's not American, but it doesn't really internalize them. Like, yeah, the government is totally like a weird attitude. So once we understand that they are part of the, they take care more of it, it's still about America. care uh, a little bit more. A lot of that caring can be a vague sense of being creeped out. Um, and a vague sense of being creeped out generally doesn't motivate people to take a lot of action to do stuff. So, you know, some people don't care at all. Some people do care, but don't care enough to do anything about it or don't know how to do anything about it. Um, and I, I would disagree with you a little bit. I think that um, there's been a fair amount of activism around this. That's one reason why the USA Freedom Act passed. Um, I know I go on Reddit sometimes, and if you look on Reddit, there's a, I don't know if it's all of Reddit or just the Reddit title, but there's an advertisement sponsored by Reddit that's like, talk to your congressperson about the NSA. We can like win a historic victory over the NSA by passing the Freedom Act. So there's definitely some stuff going on. Um, but yeah, all right. So uh, you'll have mostly given me reasons not to care about this. Um, because this is the affirmative lecture, I'm going to give you a few reasons why you might care. Uh, so um, I'll say briefly, I'm running a little bit out of time. This seems like it should probably be the core of the affirmative lecture, but I guess I'll get to it now. Um, the plan, uh, the plan, so the, the central thing, the law that the affirmative is going to say should be passed um, is called the Surveillance State Repeal Act, or the SSRA. This was a law that was introduced a couple years ago. Uh, the people who proposed it attempted to debate it at the same time that the USA Freedom Act was debated. Uh, it had zero chance of passing. The USA Freedom Act was very close 
Uh, it looked for a little bit like it might not pass. Uh, it has some minor reforms. The SS SSRA has very serious reforms to the NSA and had absolutely no chance of passing at any point. Um, basically what the SSRA does, I feel like I don't have to explain it because we've already covered it. Uh, for the most part, the major thing it does is it just repeals all three laws that I just talked about. So it repeals Section 215 of the Patriot Act. It repeals, it actually repeals the entire Patriot Act. It repeals Section 02 of the, 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. <coughs> and it repeals Executive Order 12333. And the effect of all of those things is to say NSA or Department of Homeland Security or whoever, you can look at American stuff, but you gotta get a warrant. If you have a warrant, you can look at it. If you don't have a warrant, you can't look at it. It also has a few other provisions like whistleblower protections. So people like Edward Snowden, uh, the idea is it would give them more of an ability to call out the NSA without having to move to Hong Kong and Russia um, as sort of a check on abuses in the NSA. And all this stuff is in the, the solvency evidence and the 1IC, so if you want more information on that kind of stuff, just take a look at it. All right, so 17 minutes. Um, reasons why you might want to care, uh, also known as advantages. If you're not familiar with the word advantages, advantages are just the debate word for reasons why the plan is a good idea, reasons why it would be good to pass the Surveillance State Repeal Act. So the first reason um, has to do with freedom of the press. Uh, so I think most people in here probably feel that it's unlikely the government would be interested in tracking them. And that is probably true. That said, there are people who do things which are sometimes at odds with the government, or at least with certain people in the government. The government doesn't speak with one mind. There are many different people with many different interests. One, some people in one agency have no idea what's going on in another agency. People within a given agency don't know what's going on on the other side of the agency. Um, so a journalist might want to find out what's going on in part of the government that that journalist thinks is important for Americans to know. Um, and that might mean that they have a, a contact, a secret contact with somebody in the government, a leaker, somebody who leaks information, um, to find out that information and be able to report on it. I should say that leaks uh, happen sometimes with the government's knowledge. Sometimes the government will intentionally leak something because they think it's in their interest uh, for people to know what would be uh, formally secret data. That's technically illegal. You can't leak stuff that's secret. But sometimes the government does it when they think it's in their interest or when certain people think it's in their interest. Some people also leak stuff because they think it's in the public interest to know. And that's the kind of stuff that investigative journalists would cover. In order for that to happen, a journalist needs to be able to talk to uh, and develop a contact within the government. That <coughs> has gotten a lot harder when there's concern that the government might be spying on communications. So this comes from a couple of places. The journalists are afraid that they're getting tracked. But even more important, the people in the government who might be leaking information are especially afraid they're getting tracked. Because if you are caught and prosecuted as a leaker, um, the consequences are pretty severe. And this is especially true under Obama, who has made this a priority to uh, really crack down on leakers. So uh, one example of this, Stephen Kim, who is prosecuted for leaking, said, this has been a huge blow for me and my entire family. I had to give up a job that I liked. It destroyed my marriage. My family had to spend all the money they had saved up and sell their house to pay my legal fees. I have hardly any remaining money. Um, so there have been a couple people prosecuted. It's pretty pretty catastrophic. There are worse things that could happen to you than face a prosecution for sure. Um, but it's definitely pretty, pretty bad. So people don't want to do that because they don't know if their communications are being monitored. So why does uh, investigative journalism matter? Why should leaks be something we want? You could easily think that leaks are something that we don't want because government secrets are secret for a reason and they shouldn't be disclosed. And definitely some people say that. But the affirmative argument uh, there are a few. One is that it keeps the government honest. So when the government goes too far in something, people who sort of have a conscience, who are upset by what's going on, will say, this has gone too far. The public needs to know. If the public knows, maybe it can be rolled back. Something can be done about it. Or if the public only understood the reality of what's going on, they would want to stop it. Um, and that not only causes leaks to happen, and then things 
kind of correct themselves, but also keeps, keeps people honest in the first place. They might not want to go too far because they're afraid uh, that there would be a leak. Um, there are also some specific examples of this that the affirmative talks about. The main example it talks about is drones. Uh, this isn't something I have time to go to, into too in depth. But basically, um, since Obama has taken office especially, uh, the idea has been, rather than invading countries like Iraq, which generally considered to be catastrophic, um, it would be better if there were targeted killing of terrorists, uh, or suspected terrorists, with drones. Um, drones are unpiloted by human vehicles, <coughs> operated by a dude in an Air Force base, and they go and they find people who they think are terrorists, and they kill them. Um, drones are extremely controversial for many reasons. Uh, they amount to assassinations without warrants or you know, a trial or whatever. Um, there have been high-profile cases of blowing up weddings. Uh, there have been some concerns, and this is the kind of thing an investigative journalist would look at, um, that the US classifies all males of, within a pretty broad age range uh, in an area killed by a drone strike as terrorists. It's just assumed if you are a 16 to 50 year old male and you are dead in a drone strike, you must have been a terrorist. Um, that's in the official figures, that's how it's counted. So that's the kind of thing we might not know, like nobody from the government's gonna come out and say that if there's not some kind of investigative journalism to keep it in mind. So that is an example of why investigative journalism might be important. Another example briefly is torture. Um, torture carried out by the FBI, um, by the CIA. Uh, a lot of that didn't come to light until journalists were able to find that information through sources. All right, second advantage. Um, there's actually four advantages in the packet. I'm gonna put two together uh, and I'm gonna call, because I think they're, even though they're formally separate, I think they're conceptually very close together. Uh, and that's uh, human rights and tyranny. So both of these have to do, I think, more directly with what might be called the general sense of creepiness um, of the government spying on you. What's the government doing with that? What if we live in a police state? Sort of 1984 type dystopian concerns. So the, the big question here is who cares about a right to privacy? Um, I think uh, some of y'all were, were saying, I think, part of why it's important. Um, one thing that uh, Glenn Greenwald, especially, who, who is the person who broke this known story, has said, is that uh, privacy is important for creativity and for a sense of freedom. So to be able to look at, at what you want, to be able to explore intellectual avenues you might want to explore. Um, I know when I was, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to teachers uh, who would be teaching this stuff to their kids in the coming year. Um, and I was talking about the NSA and all the stuff the NSA does and all the stuff that's surveilled. And we started talking about black phones, which are this phone that will, in theory, is not able to be tapped by anyone. Um, and people wanted to look up the black phone on Google, but they were like, should I not look up the black phone on Google? Like, they, like these teachers were scared that if they looked up black phone on Google, then they would be a suspected terrorist and the NSA would look at them. And I don't think that's true personally based on my reading, but it, it's sort of a reasonable concern. I mean, the truth is you don't know, right? You don't know what, if you search, might come up, uh, the NSA might decide is interesting, um, and that that could cause you to stop yourself to self-censor for looking at that stuff. Um, in a broader sense, um, there are some examples of historical societies, things I don't know too much about, but which I, I see references to pretty frequently. Um, things like the Stasi in East Germany, uh, Romania, uh, where it really the former Soviet Union is, is where um, people usually talk about this, where the amount of surveillance was so extreme that people really, really checked themselves. People, even with their, their conversations with their closest friends, conversations with their family, had to be really careful about what they said. And there was a general sense of distrust that sort of went with that. I think this can be something that's hard to think about, hard to conceptualize, maybe hard to, in a debate, talk about why it's important. But in my mind, it's something that's very important because I think that it's important for us to be able to have authentic and honest conversations with each other as human beings. And if we feel we aren't able to do that, um, then that takes something human away from us. Um, 
we probably aren't in that place yet. Uh, one concern is we might one day get there, or we might be sort of feeling the beginnings of that sort of idea. Um, one other uh, aspect of this, people will say, uh, all right, the government now isn't so bad, won't abuse this, whatever, uh, but what if there's some future government, right? What if there's another terrorist attack? And the president at the time decides, I want to take total authority, I want to crack down on, on everything. Um, then they already have all your data, and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, so maybe you trust the government now, maybe you don't trust the government in 10 years. Um, two final reasons why this might matter. Um, some of the evidence in your packet, and I think this is a reasonable concern, but one that's so big that it's hard to think about, is the idea that there would be a general social crisis sometime in the future. And the two reasons given for that social crisis are a big environmental crisis, so think global warming, but also maybe other environmental problems, or a crisis that has to do with income inequality. So as you all may have heard, Ronnie referenced Occupy Wall Street, the 99%. There's a lot of concerns about income inequality. Income inequality is enormous in America, and it's getting more unequal. The concern is there would be general social unrest because of this. Um, in that case, whether you think surveillance is good or bad will depend on whose side you're on. So if you want the government to win, maybe you want surveillance. If you want the protesters to win, then you probably don't want surveillance. So that's something to think about. All right. Uh, last thing I guess I'll say about that. No, I should say two more things about that. No more. All right. Uh, what are human rights? Um, human rights are a term that's thrown around a lot. Um, human rights are something that we're supposed to generally think is important, and it seems like a good idea uh, to support them. Um, sometimes people will say that rights are absolute. You cannot violate somebody's rights. Uh, you were probably taught in school that we have natural rights, that rights absolutely cannot be violated because they're given to us by God, which is uh, an idea that was central to this country in some ways. Um, I prefer to think about rights somewhat differently, and the way that some of the evidence in the packet talks about rights is a little bit different. The main way it talks about it is to say, you can think about human rights as the basic conditions for living a good life. So that doesn't mean having a million dollars, that doesn't mean having a huge house. What that means is you have access to the basic human rights, you would say food, water, maybe housing, although that's not considered a human right in the United States. Um, but the things we tend to consider human rights may be less material things like free speech. If you want a decent human life, you should be able to speak your mind basically freely. Uh, if you want a decent human life, you should be able to have a more or less free press. Um, basic, basic conditions. So there's a debate, especially as technology changes and times change, about should one of those basic conditions for human flourishing existence be considered some kind of right to privacy or right to free communication. And uh, the evidence in the packet will argue that that is something that especially now, as technology changes, as it becomes possible to intercept all communications, that is something that we should consider a right. This is different from saying that rights are absolute, that you can never violate a right because it's given by God. A right could be something you could violate for security reasons briefly but you probably wouldn't want to violate a right all the time, constantly, in the sense that mass surveillance would violate a right to privacy. All right, uh, last advantage. Uh, I'll say this is my least favorite. Um, it's about global internet freedom. So as uh, was sort of suggested earlier, the United States is not the only country that does this stuff. In fact, almost every country in the world carries out mass surveillance. Um, that's increasingly true as the technology becomes cheap. Uh, a lot of companies are eager to sell it. There's an absolutely huge, enormous global industry of people selling surveillance technology. And there are people who are down to sell it to whoever. They're down to sell it to dictators. Um, and they do. Uh, and it's cheap. You can surveil a country of millions of people for not that much money. Um, the United States has taken a stance, at least historically, that there should be internet freedom globally. What that means is a little bit unclear, but 
largely it's directed towards states like China, which censor parts of the internet, uh, in which there's no guarantee of free speech. You can be arrested for professing certain views. Um, and they will pressure governments like China, maybe governments, uh, other dictatorships, authoritarian governments, governments that want to regulate the internet, uh, and they will tell them not to do that. What's interesting, if you go to the State Department website for internet freedom, if you just search US government internet freedom, uh, they have updated nothing after 2013. They've said nothing since 2013. Why do you all think they've said nothing since 2013? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the Snowden links were so incredibly damaging. The, the reality of what the NSA doing was so damaging to the US's credibility on this issue that we just stopped talking about it. Uh, so as a result, I think the US probably is pushing for internet freedom in, or in certain <coughs> places. Definitely people are still talking about China, so, so repressive, so authoritarian, they gotta stop, whatever. Um, but a lot of the high level official stuff, uh, at least as far as I can tell, has stopped since the Snowden leaks, and also the stuff that does exist is now far less effective um, because people have, think the US has no credibility to be asking for those sorts of things. Um, this raises maybe a few questions. Uh, one is, the, is, does US pressure matter? Do other countries care if the US pressures them to respect internet freedom? And the answer is maybe. Uh, it does seem unlikely to me that China would have a totally free and open internet because the US asked them to, even if they asked them to with more credibility. Um, but maybe at the margins it does matter. Another question, is it too late? Uh, these things have already been revealed. There's already a lot of distrust in the United States. And a lot of the surveillance technology has already been distributed to other countries. So most of it is already in place and would now have to be reverse, not reverse engineered, but would have to be gotten rid of. Um, we're sort of at a late stage in the game. Uh, and a final question is, does the United States really care? Which is the obvious question raised by the fact that we do all the surveillance. Um, there are political reasons why the US might want to pressure a country like China, try to make them look bad on uh, internet surveillance or stuff. But the question of do they actually care that much? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Probably different people have different levels of caring. Um, but that is probably an important question. Um, there are definitely people who think the, the real goal of the internet freedom agenda, or the primary goal, I shouldn't say the real goal, uh, the primary goal is more about uh, stopping you from pirating music and uh, movies. Uh, so more protecting the internet for commercial interests, businesses, than it really is about uh, surveillance. All right, so that's, that's everything I've got. Uh, we have, if you all have, a couple minutes for questions, I think we can probably do that. Anyone questions? So the idea is, sorry, I don't think I was super clear about that. But, uh, the idea is there would be like a mass movement or maybe even a revolution as a result of those things, um, which on one hand sounds crazy, maybe, but on the other hand, you know, historically there are revolutions. Obviously we're in a country that was created by a revolution. Those things tend to happen when there are serious systematic problems. Um, so if people think that that would be something that would be possible. And then once that happens, obviously it's much harder to have a revolution if you're surveilled all the time. Yeah. You mentioned the senator who was prosecuted for leaking information. I thought the Patriot Act was specifically for acts of terrorism and I don't think leaking was can be considered terrorism. So. Under that act, how are they able to prosecute him? So uh, that guy who was prosecuted for leak, I don't know too much about him, but basically, as far as I can tell, there's no absolute evidence that surveillance has been used against leakers. We don't know whether it has or hasn't, um, but there is a general fear. So there was a report released by Human Rights Watch that basically said that they interviewed a bunch of journalists and a bunch of government people, and they talked about how scared they were and how it was messing them up. So it's really the fear of it more than whether it's actually happening. Yeah. So I know there's like some companies that like if someone like wants to hire someone in some company to go to some company and say, hey, like can you give me some info about someone and they give them data, sell them data. If like there was like limited surveillance, like a lot of those companies like might have to like be shut down or go bankrupt or whatever, which could have like potentially like affect a lot of economies, right? 
Yeah, so that's definitely important. So, so Google and Facebook and Twitter have your data, and their business model is based on having your data because they sell that data to advertisers. So people have said the business model of the internet is surveillance in the sense of those private companies. So no surveillance, no, no business on the internet. Um, one thing which maybe cuts against that is that uh, this affirmative just discusses limiting the federal government's surveillance. So it gets rid of the government's ability to do that, but private companies can still do it. movements against various dictators. So thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out in the street protesting uh, you know, their leaders for democracy or various different things that they might have wanted. Um, at that time, those governments would do surveillance on the activists, which would let them know a bunch of things. It would let them know when are they planning to hold a protest so we can you know, have police there, we can be ready to stop it. What are they planning to do at the protest so we can plan ahead? Maybe who are the leaders of the protest? We can arrest them. It makes it much harder to hold that kind of protest, um, which by extension makes it much harder to have a successful uh, movement or to, let's say, have democracy in Egypt. Um, similarly, in the United States, you can imagine a people's movement against income inequality. People could come out on the streets and be like, you know what, we want corporations to have less money, we want higher wages for ourselves, uh, we can't live on the wages that we have, um, and several things could happen. The, the movement could be successful, it could not be successful. Surveillance will make it harder for that movement to be successful. So the reason I say, whose side are you on, right? Surveillance will make it harder for any movement to be successful. If you think the movement should fail, then you probably want surveillance to happen. If you think the movement should succeed, then uh, you probably don't want surveillance. Does that make sense? Anything else? Yeah, last question. Does Emory track our internet activities? Does what? Does the university track our internet activities? Yeah, they definitely have uh, They have copies of it. Um, I doubt yeah, they look through it. Uh, there's definitely pressure occasionally to track down on like, um, on like torrenting and stuff, like pirating. Um, I probably wouldn't power to anything while you're here. All right, well, thanks for listening. Uh, I'll turn it over to...